The prospectors were a special breed, and in those early pioneering days, they tolerated incredible hardship. Water was always a problem as the prospector moved further westward, and the lack of it, for most of the year, caused many a painful death. Prospectors, delirious with thirst, had slashed their wrists to drink their blood, and others had been found with pounds of gold on them and had tried to eat their boots to survive. Confrontations with the indigenous population were sometimes fatal, as the prospectors scoured the country in their search for gold. In other parts, the Aboriginal people, with their extraordinary bush skills, had often helped the prospectors locate gold and water in otherwise inhospitable areas. To the south, in Tasmania, they encountered different hardships. The arid, hostile desert and oppressive heat of the mainland became impenetrable forests, mountainous terrain and freezing temperatures. In 1871, James Smith embarked on a five-month trek into this almost impenetrable region of Tasmania. With nothing more than his bush skills and a gut instinct, he panned the creeks that eventually led him to Mount Bischoff and a fabulously rich mountain of tin. The Mount Bischoff Mining Company was formed and Smith received over 4,000 of the five pound shares. Years later, the price quoted never fell below 80 pounds and dividends paid by the company eclipsed those of any other mine in Australia. Smith's discovery changed the course of Tasmanian history and was the forerunner of several mineral discoveries which dragged the state out of a recession and laid the foundation for what became a thriving mining industry. The first traces of gold in the Northern Territory were discovered in the early 1870s by workers on the Overland Telegraph Line between Adelaide and Palmerston, later to be called Darwin. A prospecting company was formed by a South Australian grazier and they found the first gold-bearing reef at Yam Creek. A second reef was discovered in the Howley District and these discoveries caused the inevitable rush as the word spread. The town of Palmerston was seething with gold fever. New parties arrived every week, but many weren't equipped for the rigours of the territory's hot tropical climate. Disease was rampant, and the incessant rain and humidity had a detrimental effect on many. There was no fresh food, flour and rice were infested with weevils, and like life on other gold fields, alcohol was the undoing of many. Some less scrupulous merchants peddled a concoction of kerosene flavoured with Worcestershire sauce, ginger and sugar. Malaria became widespread, and scurvy and dysentery killed many others. The misconduct in the Northern Territory was beyond anything in the history of gold mining. A number of costly equipped prospecting or picnic parties were established by syndicates down south. Many of these men were totally unacquainted with prospecting and some never proceeded further than Darwin. Others advanced just a few miles into the interior or never lost sight of the new telegraph line, while others planted themselves on the bank of a creek and quietly accumulated their pay. When their grog and provisions ran out, they simply struck camp and pronounced the territory a duffer. By the 1870s, South Australia had replaced Cornwall as the largest copper producer in the British Empire. But in a few short years, the price of copper collapsed and the mines were exhausted of their rich ore. But just over the border in New South Wales was one of the most spectacular discoveries in Australia's history. It was a discovery of such magnitude that even today, the company is one of the largest companies in Australia. Several scattered hills rose above the barren landscape and under one, enormous riches. Riches that would exceed even those of Ballarat and Bendigo. Its wealth wasn't evident to the first prospectors who had climbed it, 
disappointed as they were with the poverty of these huge boulders of manganese and iron oxide. Charles Rasp, a boundary rider at the Mount Gipps station, again assayed the rocks. And as expected, the results were disappointing. But with his limited knowledge of geology and mineralogy, he still hoped to find wealth at depth. So he formed a syndicate with six other men and a shaft was dug. For 12 months, it was really doubtful we'd make anything out of it. Some of us were paying half of our wages to keep it going. The original ore they processed in Adelaide returned an astonishing 750 ounces of silver to the tonne. The gamble had paid off. And then 18 months later, some incredibly large mineral loads were discovered, some of them over 500 feet wide. Now in most mines in Australia, a mineral load just five feet wide was considered large. The original investors became some of the wealthiest people in Australia. For their ignorance of minerals and geology, they acquired a deposit that many more experienced people had overlooked. And within 10 years, 35,000 people were living and working in Broken Hill. And BHP became the largest company in Australia and held that crown for over 100 years. The Kimberley region, at its best, is the most spectacular country on the Australian continent. At its worst, during the heat of the summer wet season, it can be hell on earth. As the initial booms in the other states began to wane, the last and without a doubt the greatest frontier was about to be conquered. Western Australia had seen a few prospecting parties before, but it wasn't until Charles Hall and John Slattery began to search for gold in the north of the state in 1886 that Western Australia's incredible richness began to be disclosed. On their first trip they found 10 ounces, on their second, they found over 80 ounces, and within months, Halls Creek became the magnet to the longest overland gold trail Australia has ever seen. Prospectors from all over the world trekked the huge distances to Halls Creek. They walked or rode from Queensland, across the Northern Territory, or followed the telegraph line up from Adelaide to the most remote gold field in Australia. Others were simply put ashore at Wyndham, where not even a jetty stood. Alone they set off for the Halls Creek Gold. Russian Jack hauled more than his own swag to the fields and carried several diggers onto the next waterhole. In another instance, he carried a sick prospector over 300 kilometres to reach medical help. His feat symbolised the mateship and endurance of the pioneers of a region then lacking in all the amenities of civilization. An Afghan mountain maid made a lot of money out of the fields, and hers wasn't from digging for gold. Those who made it to Halls Creek found the flies and heat were plentiful, the gold and water scarce. Many died of scurvy and dysentery here. Within five years, the surface gold had played out and the reefs could only be worked by heavy crushing machinery. But by this time, the prospectors had discovered gold further south and had moved on. Here, fields were opening up quickly and Western Australia was becoming the colossus of gold mining. In July of 1890, J.F. Connolly discovered a reef near Geraldton and the die was well and truly cast. The Yilgarin was about to become the gateway to the richest gold fields Australia has ever known. By 1892, Southern Cross already had several small gold mines operating. But in August, things were at a particularly low ebb. Ore treatment problems, the lack of water and trouble with mining machinery had increased production costs at the three main mines. Wages were cut and the workers went on strike. And then Arthur Bailey rode in from the east with 554 ounces of gold. The slump in Southern Cross was over and the town became the gateway to the world famous Coolgardie Goldfields. <laughs> 
Earlier, Bailey and Ford had ridden out into a particularly hard area of the country east of Southern Cross to prospect for gold. We reached what is now known as Coolgardie at about 5pm. Water was becoming scarce, so we camped near a small rock pool. In the morning we went for the horses. I was leading my horse back over what was later called Fly Flat when I picked up a piece of gold about half an ounce. I think we were more excited about that little piece of gold than any we found later. In the next hour, we picked up nearly 100 ounces. Fly Flat later became the main street of Coolgardie. It was a triumphant discovery for Bailey and Ford, but unfortunately, the new field had already been pegged by a man named Anston. Tragically, he never registered his claim. When Bailey returned to Southern Cross to register his claim, he was followed back there by most of the population of the town. We found gold galore. We could see it glittering in the sunlight for at least 20 yards in front of us. On top of the ridge was the cap of the reef studded with gold. Thousands followed from around the world and Kulgadi fast became a town. Overnight, the price of horses rose from five pounds to 50 and in no time, 26 hotels lined the main street. Three newspapers were established and even a zoo had been laid out. It was a mecca to over 20,000 people. Hundreds would be seen wandering off into the bush at the slightest mention of gold. On one occasion, Billy Frost turned up in town with over 40 ounces. Siberia, about 70 miles from here, was met with the standard rush. The trail led some to gold, and, as in many cases in the desert, some to a painful death from dehydration. The harshness of the area left many prospectors buried in unmarked graves along the tracks. And here, in Kulgadi Cemetery alone, there are over a thousand men buried, most under the age of 26. Perhaps the richest patch of gold came from a small digging not far from here. In a hole just four feet by five feet, 10,000 ounces of gold were dollied, and Kulgadi was spellbound. The hypnotic spell cast by the Londonderry lease was not due to the massive amount of gold already taken, but on what was thought to lie deeper. Investors pursued the young John Mills to sell, and the new owners floated the Londonderry Gold Mining Company in impressive style. Word of the finds spread like wildfire, and prospectors came from all over the world seeking their fortunes. And 20 miles east of here, the greatest gold field Australia would ever know lay waiting. Paddy Hannon at nearing 50 was no youngster for prospecting. For 30 years he searched the fields across Australia and New Zealand, moving from one rumour to the next, always hoping to strike it rich. When he and his mate Tom Flanagan heard the news of Bailey's find, like all optimistic prospectors, they joined the rush. They were among the first arrivals in Coolgardie after Bailey and Ford had announced their discovery. For nine months they scratched around in the flats and the gullies, making a meagre living. 1893 was a year of fines and rumours. And in May there was talk of gold near Mount Yule, supposedly about 50 miles east of here. Nobody knew who started the rumour, nobody really knew where to go, and the find was never located. But there was a rush to the Mount Yule area anyway. Hannon and Flanagan moved out a few days after the main groups. Three days later they were camped about 25 miles out from Coolgardie held up by a horse that had thrown a shoe. They were still only about halfway towards Mount Yule. Specking about, Hannon found several small nuggets, and after a couple of days, they'd collected over 100 ounces. It was a momentous time in Australian history, for if some have described other Australian finds as the El Dorado, 
this was certain to become the mother of them all. In the first week, 1,500 prospectors converged on Hannon's find, soon to be known as Kalgoorlie, and pegged leases. The winter rain started to fall, and the early prospectors found hundreds of ounces of gold gleaming in the wet soil. They worked on their hands and knees in a frenzy, their knives thrusting into the red mud. But Kalgoorlie didn't boom overnight. Hannon's was seen as one of the many finds that year. It didn't have the glamour of Kulgadi, where gold had been chopped from reefs with tomahawks, or Menzies, where millions of dollars worth were just picked up off the ground. The early prospectors were after the alluvial or surface gold, and it wasn't until four years later that Kalgoorlie's great wealth began to be understood. Two men, Brookman and Pierce, had already been sent from Adelaide by a group of financiers. Fifteen days after the rush began, they camped with thousands of other prospectors at Hannon's find. They found that all the rich alluvial areas had been pegged. The only areas left were the Ironstone Hills, over three miles away. Hannon and other prospectors had looked over these hills before and decided they were not gold-bearing. Brookman and Pierce spent a fortune pegging hundreds of acres, which became known as Brookman's Sheep Run, named by the prospectors in scorn of their ludicrous pegging. But in poetic justice, Brookman's Sheep Run was to contain the golden fleece that Western Australia, and indeed Australia, has ridden on for over 100 years. It contained gold in mysterious load formations and became Kalgoorlie's Golden Mile the richest square mile of gold-bearing ground in the world. And over a hundred years later, it is still being worked, where 20 billion ounces of gold has been dug out of Hannon's find. Yeah, I still heard a fire. As the century drew to an end, the original gold fields of Bathurst had long declined. Victoria and Queensland had already financed their own transition from alluvial to deep underground mining with a little help from overseas capital. But this pattern of development didn't occur in Western Australia. British capital flooded in and the new gold fields boomed. London was the financial capital of the world and there were millions of pounds waiting development. The mines around the Kalgoorlie area were floated with impressive style. Holes in the ground were converted to rich gold mines with the stroke of a pen, most hopelessly overcapitalised. In the last three months of 1894, 77 new companies were registered in London. Then the ore failed at depth. The rich London dairy float, which so impressed the British investors, crashed. Bailey's reward at Coolgardie and others also failed to live up to expectations. It appeared the gold ran out when the underlying bedrock was reached. Each week, ships were still unloading hundreds more eager gold seekers. Typhoid became a problem as they waited on the outskirts of Perth for Teamsters to load their drays for the long journey to the gold fields. Hannon's find, which was officially named the town of Kalgoorlie, didn't escape disease either. With 3,000 prospectors working on the alluvial fields, it had its typhoid problem too. The early Hessian Kalgoorlie Hospital had to struggle with this as well as the dust and the flies. Only two pints of water was the daily ration for a nurse. The heat inside the camp was suffocating and I'd always hate it when old Nick would call in the morning asking how many graves we'd need by the end of the day. <laughs> 
I'd have no discussion with him and just hand him a slip of paper. Because water was such a precious commodity for most of the year in the arid regions of Western Australia, dry blowing was a method used for extracting gold. No form of labour is more exasperating than dry blowing and in no way amusing. Dust is thick in your eyes and clogs your nose and your throat becomes as dry as lime and the gold eludes your grasp. And you've laboured for ten hours a day without a speck. Your spirits begin to flag. Damn Coolgardie, damn the track, damn it there and damn it back. Damn the heat and damn the weather, damn the goldfields altogether. But just when the goldfields were being dismissed as surface wildcats, Kalgoorlie broke through the bedrock and struck a load that went 10 ounces to the tonne, one of the richest load systems ever discovered. The boom accelerated again as promoters brought up hundreds of outcrops and leases and fortunes were made on the speculative profits of the stock market. However crazy was the wholesale purchase of these underdeveloped outcrops over hundreds of square miles, it brought about a rapid rate of prospecting and discovery. British capital flooded in again as these rich ore bodies were discovered. There were ten quick years of development as another 1,200 companies were floated. The railway pushed through late in 96, connecting Kalgoorlie to Perth. Generators were tracked up and the town had power. Government offices, law courts and the post office with its bold four-sided clock were built and trams ran down the main street. An engineering wonder was constructed with the 380 mile pipeline from Perth to bring water to the desert goldfields. That night saw the largest party ever in Hannon Street. Never had I heard so much talk about water and seen so little of that being drunk. Kalgoorlie probably felt it really had come of age when these magnificent two-storey hotels were built. The Palace and Exchange, with their bars handsomely fitted and stocked, a real oasis in the dry Australian desert. In 1897, a young man by the name of Herbert Hoover, who later became the 31st President of the United States of America, was sent here by a British firm of mining engineers. A lot was said about Hoover, and while in Australia he gained a reputation for ruthlessness and was called a womanising rogue whose unscrupulous behaviour was hardly desirable presidential material. Years later, after leaving Kalgoorlie, he penned these endearing words to a local barmaid. Do you ever dream, my sweetheart, of a twilight long ago, of a park in old Kalgoorlie where the bougainvilleas grow? Years have flown since then, but the hour that fills my dreaming, was it only yesterday? Where you kissed me in the twilight of a summer long ago. I have fought my fight and triumphed on the map I've writ my name, but I prize one hour of loving more than 50 years of fame. But one thing was sure, he was a romantic poet. By now, most of the surface deposits were exhausted and the mines went deep. Capital and the big mining companies moved in and the prospectors moved out. The alluvial heydays were over and around Australia the trends continued. Victoria and Queensland both experienced dramatic downturns. In 1900, over 75,000 men worked the gold fields, but by the First World War, only 6,000 remained. The world was changing, and the prospector was about to make his mark on another front. The prospectors of the Australian gold fields joined the Anzacs at Gallipoli. The trenches they dug weren't for gold, but for the glory of the British Empire. 